I'm delighted to have Michael Bustamante here um, to converse about his spectacular book, um, Cuban Memory Wars, along with other things. Um, Michael Bustamante is Associate Professor of History and the Bacardi Chair of Cuban Studies at the University of Miami. Thank you so much, Michael, for agreeing to do this interview. Uh, of course, <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> So I'm very curious as to how you came up with the title for your book. And I say that because the book is very exceptional in many ways. It strives to put into dialogue um, and sometimes conflictive dialogue, clearly, the narratives of identity and the narratives of experience as they were happening in real time and being constructed in real time across the straits, uh, mostly um, between islanders of Cuba, Cubans on the island, uh, whoever they might be, as well as those in the United States, but principally in South Florida. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could tell us why you chose to use um, Cuban memory wars as opposed to another word, like perhaps Cuban memory battles or Cuban memory struggles. Why that word? Well, it's a it's a great question, but it's one that um, forces me to make something of a confession. I think you know better than I do that us as authors don't always have the complete say over the titles of our, of our books and articles and things like that. There's always sort of a negotiation and truth be told, I think the original phrase that was in sort of the working title of the manuscript was something more uh, less sort of dramatic sounding like Cuban memory struggles or, or, or something like that. Um, so Cuban memory wars was a title that I landed on in conversation with the press. I think they were looking for something that, you know, has that impact, but, you know, I've really grown to love it. I think it actually reflects um, quite well what the book really argues, which is not just that Cubans are divided about how they understand their past. I mean, who isn't, right? What what na what nation, uh, what, what group of people doesn't have sort of divisions over their history as part of the, the national fabric? Um, but what I argue with that is that in the Cuban case, these battles to sort of construct narratives of where the revolution came from, what it was about, whether it fulfilled its promises or not, that these are really absolutely central to understanding the wider Cuban conflict. And if we think of that conflict as, granted, um, having periods of actual armed conflict, but not generally being a period of armed conflict, right, being this sort of Cold War conflict, I think the realm of the discursive, the realm of, of argument, the realm of, um, of symbolic uh, narrative, um, the way in which people sort of suture their own understandings of their life stories against the backdrop of different narratives of the nation's past, this is really, that it is a war, right? It is, and it's a war, and I think plays out, it's, it's a war of words, if, if, if nothing else. So I, I think the title is, um, is, is appropriate in that regard. Yes, and I think that one of the highlights of your approach is that we really get to see the agency of Cubans, even on the far right, uh, as opposed to how perhaps we have understood their attitudes or their actions as um, what the consequences of CIA recruitment. You know, certainly that yeah. was a, a reality, but there is there's much more to the agency of Cubans, um, even those who chose. Um, to do stuff like work for the CIA in order to subvert um, the communist regime on the island. Yeah, and they're often doing it not without sort of qualms or sort of debating in their own heads about the pros and cons of those kinds of affiliations. Um, uh, I mean, and that's another aspect of, of the title that I think is important. It's not Cuban memory war, it's wars plural. There are multiple sort of fronts of battle here. There's obviously sort of the big war discursive battle between you know the Cuban revolutionary states kind of efforts to construct an increasingly uniform narrative of what the revolution is about and where it came from and how citizens should think about it that is counterposed to a certain kind of emergent almost quasi counterofficial history that emerges in Miami but on both sides of the Florida Straits there are sort of wars within those wars right there's deep battles inside Miami among different factions and groups to narrate sort of where where the exile community came from or or where they themselves in Cuba's past went wrong and and who's at fault for that right and who should have the legitimacy to sort of lead the exile struggle based on past histories and and who is delegitimized and similarly within the front of the revolution as you know well Lily because you've you know written about this extensively the revolutionary front is not a sort of a, unif a unified thing at the at the start i mean for all of sort of the the unified spirit that the revolution seems to 
um, imbuing people. Uh, there are deep battles right away about, you know, sort of who has the historical bona fides to kind of speak in this thing called the revolution's name, right? So there are these wars that are kind of constant and 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 um and and they're shape shifting over time. Um, so I think I think that the plural aspect of the title is is just as important as the as the term itself. One of the most original aspects of Cuban memory wars is its focus on the visitas or the first visits by Cuban exiles from 1978 to 1979 to the island. Mm -hmm. These were the first visits allowed uh, by the Cuban government and they had an enormous impact. Today, it's sort of inconceivable that Cubans uh, would spend 20 years without visiting the island if they wanted to visit. In fact, so much of the economy and the government relies on the money that is either sent from Cubans abroad or that is brought by Cubans directly to their family members. And one way or another, there is um, a benefit to those to those visits today. So I wonder if you could explain why these first visitas were so significant. What, what effects did they have and what were their long-term legacies? Sure. Um, so the chapter about the the so-called visitas de la comunidad, which is a euphemism, of course, so one has to recognize it, um, uh, is the chapter that concludes the book. Um, it was a moment that uh, obviously the story of the Cuban memory wars goes on past 1979. It's very alive and well uh, today, uh, to put it mildly. But you know, all authors need to find a bookend for their for their for their work. And for me, 1979 represents an initial bookend, a good a good bookend, because if the beginning part of the book sort of tells the story of emigration and fragmentation of these narratives. 79 is this moment where physically the two sides sort of meet face to face again. Right. Um, and again, not everybody who's in exile goes back, of course, but a hundred thousand do, and that's 15% or so of, of all exiles are in the U S. So this was a major deal. I mean, it's, it is difficult to sort of conceive how impactful this was. I mean, there had been a couple of exceptional cases of exiles who had gone back before 19, late 1978 and, and 1979, but you know, for all intents and purposes, this is uh, this is you know, people whose experiences, um, narratives, stories had been written out of the historical record in Cuba, written out of the public narrative, or if it is included, sort of you know, told in a very simplified, demonizing way, are suddenly showing up back on on you know in the national territory at the invitation of the very government that had denigrated the idea of departure for so long as in fact an act of um you know tantamount to treason right so the the very fact of permitting these visits to happen in and of itself is a, a, a huge not only reversal of of policy but it's a reversal in sort of the memory narrative of the of the cuban state um and so that it, it's bound to have an impact and when you add on to the fact sort of what happens during the visits themselves you know, both at the kind of grand scale and then at the granular scale in terms of family, um, you know, individual exchanges, uh, you know, within families, I, I just found really rich material that in some sense is kind of difficult to summarize or kind of make a neat point about because all those, those visits could mean very different things to different people based on sort of where they were sitting or what their experience was. It might not have been the same thing to go back after 20 years versus uh, you know, 10. I mean, there were some people who had left as late as the early 70s and who were only going back, you know, eight or nine years later. They had lived much more of the revolution compared to someone that lived left in 1960. And for them, going back to Cuba in 1979 is really like landing on another planet, right? Um, but I think so much of what those visits accomplish is, on the one hand, in sort of reconstituting family bonds that I think to different degrees families had tried to maintain despite the implicit and explicit pressures to not do so. Um, they they have the way of kind of decentering sort of capital R and capital E revolutionary and exile historical memory narratives. It's suddenly like, you know, family is family. I'm going to hear your life story and you're going to hear mine sort of almost outside the framework of the, the memory narrative of the nation. Um, but for the, the competing memory uh, networks or narratives of the nation, these visits are obviously impactful as well. On the one hand, and, and the results are not neat. I mean, I think on the one hand, people on the island are, suddenly realizing that the way that the history of the, those who left has been told to them does not match with the way that they represent their own realities. And so that's very jarring. But I think also there are many cases of exiles who go back and realize like, huh, history here moved on it, for, for good or ill, right? And these are, you know, my family members, my cousins, 
you know, there, but for the grace of God go I, right? Like I could have been that person if my family had made a different choice or their circumstances had been different, but they now have a set of life experiences that I don't, right? And so I think it's, it can be, um, it's, it's that paradox of these visits being incredibly moving in terms of sort of reuniting the fabric of a nation uh, across family lines, but also highlighting real vast differences in experience, like these sort of breaches that that can't be bridged in a sense, right? And I think both of those things came out of the interviews that I did. So um, it's somewhat of a, an uncomfortable, maybe a not entirely neat place to end the book. It doesn't solve the Cuban memory wars by any means, but again, it's this moment when it, it, fe it felt like sort of a, a full circle moment for the purposes of the book, of the book I was writing. Well, I arrived in Miami as a teenager in the early eighties, and then it was considered among some circles that visiting Cuba was to legitimate the Cuban government. And anything that legitimated yeah. the Cuban government was uh, taboo and a political treason. It was something you know that was supposed to be a source of shame if in fact you did participate in trips to Cuba or had deep connections to relatives on the island. Yeah, so, absolutely. And, and, you... and, and, and even in the late seventies, I mean, that was the case. So it, it's, there are very, uh, very divided feelings about going back because the sense even at the time is that, well, the Cuban government isn't doing this because they want to have a kumbaya moment, right? They're doing this because the economy was not in a great place in set in 79 or in the late seventies. There was also this negotiation with the United States that had um, during the Carter years that had hit some rocky, hit a sort of a rocky patch because of Cuba's involvement in Angola. Um, and so there was a sense, there was a suspicion that in some sense that the later revealed diplomatic records have confirmed that the Cuban government in part is trying to sort of put on the back on the bilateral agenda things that the Carter administration had been asking, like the right to, to family reunification and, and thereby sort of get the bilateral negotiation back on course. Um, but absolutely, Miami was a controversial thing in 1979. Not everyone went. I heard stories of people who went but didn't really tell their neighbors. Um, but I think I was also just impressed by how how many reacted sort of automatically, like, you know, complaining about the very the, the high cost, this notion that you were going to go visit your family, but the only way to go was to buy a package tour where you were, had a hotel stay, like even if you could go stay in your childhood bedroom, right? Like, I mean, it it, it really rankled people, the, the you know, deeply that they they felt they were being sort of squeezed for their resources, um, but they went anyway. And I think they, they didn't want to let those impediments or that manipulation get in the way of that family tie that they saw as more important. Right. And so, but absolutely at the, at the time, it wasn't that this was an uncontroversial thing. It was, it was deeply controversial. Well, you grew up in South Florida and know its political culture very well. So I wonder if you could address or comment on the latest wave of, of immigrants, political values and their reputation as supporting Trumpism or Trump himself. For many of us, for many observers, it's very ironic, especially those of us who know the authoritarianism of the Cuban state extremely well and see that Trumpism and Fidelismo and in fact, Comunismo, in terms of its authoritarianism, have a lot in common. So I wonder if you could comment about the emergence of a very obvious, visible political culture among recent immigrants. And I would, I would say you could date that any way you want. You could say those who arrived in the last 10 years, for instance. Uh, yeah. But I would love to know that because I think many of us wonder what, what explains this kind of view and, and what explains the embrace of Trump by people who one would imagine have very little to benefit from his politics. Yeah, well, um, if I knew the answer to that question, I'd be in a different business. I'd be in the different business of political <laughs> consulting, I guess. Um, I mean, a couple of things I would say. First, I think it's important to to rewind the clock a little bit and to at least acknowledge that in the history of the exile community writ large, you know, it's long been the case that being anti-communist does not necessarily mean being pro-democratic. I mean, uh, the the Cold War is full of those legacies, right? Um, and I think if one looks at, you know, how the exile community, and again, I'm generalizing because the exile community, one of the points of my book is not a monolith. Um, but if one looks at how the exile community reacted to things like the coup of uh, Pinochet in 1973 or the Argentine junta, or um, I mean, you certainly find plenty of people um, not aggressively defending those regimes, but you don't 
you you get a you do find this narrative of well okay the military regimes and say the southern cone you know sort of saved the nation from communism right which is sort of very you know in line with a, a, a kind of a certain u.s foreign policy narrative that justified right-wing authoritarianism in the name of cold war prerogatives so i think i think that that background and that tension between anti-communism not being the same thing as really being consistent and um practicing the democratic values you preach that that's an old thing in a, in a certain respect what i think is new is the scale of migration we've seen over the last two years, um, but also added on to the scale of just steady migration from Cuba since the 1990s, right? It's it until 2022 in this post pandemic surge in migration, um, there had been other sort of migration crises on a more minor scale. But one of the things that the migration accords of the 90s did was create a fairly kind of steady flow of migrants. And so from 19... 95 through 2016, I think I think these are Jorge Duani's numbers, um, something like 600,000 Cubans have come, which through varying means, but most of them legal uh, migration, you know, uh, migratory means. And this is far more than came, you know, in the 1960s, right? So it's this whole sort of sector of this Cuban exon community about which very little is known in terms of their political beliefs, their political values, their sort of their processes of socialization. Um, I, I've heard, you know, academics argue that Kind of the big studies that were done on those first waves of exiles in terms of their socialization and adjustments in the United States that no one's done that you know similar work on this later cohort from the 1990s on, uh, which is more than one cohort, right? So, um, what is surprising though is that if you look at the polls that were done by Guillermo Grenier at FIU for many many years about Cuban American political attitudes, you did see you know through the Obama administration a clear trend that those who were more recently, uh, those who had emigrated more recently were more likely to support a kind of a more open US policy toward Cuba for good or ill, were more likely to support the idea of traveling to the islands, sending remittances, were more sort of practical in their mentality. One got the sense that these were folks who might not have liked the Cuban government that they left behind at all, but didn't necessarily have faith that some kind of a hardline approach from the United States would would you know bring any sort of concrete dividend. So at least get out of my way, let me go see my family, support my mom if I can. It's that sector. It's not the old exiles, right, of the 60s and 70s and their kids. It's that sector, the post-1990s migrants and on, they're the ones that have radicalized most strongly toward the Republican Party under Trump. Um, and you know what's behind that, I think, is still something that people are trying to parse. Um, my sense is that it's really not about um, Trump sort of throwing red meat in terms of I'm going to crack down and the embargo and, and you know, end the Obama deal. Although I think people did, there was so much hope invested in the Obama moment that when it didn't sort of, you know, achieve that big bang moment for Cuba within a very short time period that I think is unfair to judge it by two years People are sort of embittered by that, right? And it becomes easy to make an argument that um, this policy somehow didn't work, as if the opposite has, you know, over 50, 50 plus years. But I, in some, in so many ways, I don't think, I don't think the appeal of Trumpism is about that. I think there's such a deep bitterness among this most recent cohort of migrants. They're so frustrated with the lack of um, the slow pace of change on the island, the unwillingness of the government to not only move consistently forward with a project of economic reforms, but, you know, implement any kind of political reforms that they're seeking almost to reject everything that they know. Right. Um, and, and I think there's something about Trump that is he is the uber American. Right. It's not about tough, tough talk on the Cuban government. It's the this myth of the self-made man. Um, there's a great article by the anthropologist uh, Aniana hernandez Raguant that she did sort of ethnographic work in Hialeah during the, the heat of the last presidential campaign. And this is her argument, right? She was shocked walking around Hialeah and seeing the relative dearth of Cuban flags flying and the relative profusion of American flags on, on, on Cuban homes. And this, I think, is somewhat of a shift, um, potentially. But um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult because, I mean, on a lighter note, and I'll just end with this, um, you know, Miami-Dade County and the Cuban community in particular also is very well known for having some of the highest sort of numbers of Obamacare enrollment in the nation. Um, it's a function of Miami being a service-based economy when where not a lot of people, you know, get health insurance through their work, right? So the public option is really important. Uh, and we know Cubans are health conscious. And yet I remember in the context of the last presidential campaign, seeing like, you know, a mom and pop 
kind of insurance agency that, you know, when Obamacare came on the map, they had this big sign that said, um, you know, aquí, you know, consiga tu Obamacare, lo que sea. And they had a big, <laughs> a big photo of Obama. And then when the Trump thing happened, they just tacked a photo of Trump next to Obama, like as if there was no cognitive dissonance there, as if Trump himself hadn't spent his entire term um, together with the Republican Party trying to eliminate that policy, right? So, yeah. so there's a, there, there is a huge inconsistency, absolutely. But I think we have to take it seriously. And, and what I will say, and, and forgive me, I'll make one, one last point. I think the Democrats, it, it goes to your question about the comparison, right? And, and why is it that more people don't see echoes of what they left behind in Trumpism um, and the things that they oppose that they left behind? This I had the opportunity, I think in it was in 2018 or 2019 to be a fly in the wall with um, some friends who are more in the political business. And we're trying to sort of test the with focus groups messaging along those lines to Cuban voters from the 1990s cohort and on these advertisements that were trying to make the point, you know, Fidel S. Trump, you know, this sort of established this kind of equivalency. And I can't tell you how aggressive was the um, rejection among those voters of that kind of comparison. For them, it was beyond the pale to even make that kind of a comparison, right? And right. so, and, and yet I have seen the Biden administration just put out a slew of ads that are trying to make this comparison again. Right. And it's not going to work. For whatever reason, that that is not going to work because it, that, that you're, you're, it's, it's an advertisement that essentially tells people that they're hypocrites. And as political advertising, you know, who wants to be told that you're a hypocrite, yeah. right? As as much as we may think that that's the case. So um, it's a very messy situation, but I think one that deserves deeper reflection and study. And sorry for the long answer. No, you never apologize. We're historians and we're Cuban, imagine. So we talk <laughs> forever. <laughs> so I want to ask one last question because we're coming up against um, 65 years since um, Batista fled Cuba and the revolutionary government established its footholds. So I wonder when you look forward, you know, what is the best case scenario that you could see for Cuba? I think part of that question has to be, especially when it's addressed to you, what is the role of memory in the best case scenario for Cuba? Yeah. Gosh, that's a loaded question. Um... It is difficult at the present juncture to envision best case scenarios. I mean, let me start with that. Um, the crisis in Cuba on all fronts is as deep as it's ever been. I mean, from the aspect, from the point of view of memory politics, what's interesting about going to Cuba, as I did in August, um, is hearing people parse through comparisons with the special period, right? So that's that's sort of people are remembering that moment and, and comparing it with the present and and in, in different ways, and and even people. One refrain I heard was, "No, no, no. The special period was was way better than this because, and th there's a little bit of the, I think nostalgia here, admittedly that's that's um, uh, distorting, right? But uh, no, in the special period, you know, yeah, there wasn't anything, but nobody had anything, and so we were all working together. You know, it was like you know, all all for one, one for all kind of a kind of a vibe. Even though I think." As historians, we know that wasn't exactly always <laughs> always the case. But I think today, because this crisis also coincides, it's not in the absence of market forces in the Cuban economy, right? There are new market forces in the Cuban economy. There are new inequities in the Cuban economy that predate this crisis, that are not caused by the crisis, although they're aggravated, aggravated by it. And so I think people are seeing, you know, people who are trying to eke out an existence on a 2,000 peso pension after 34 years working for the, in my cousin's case, as a pharmacist, right, with the, the state uh, pharmacy network. Um, and when that 2,000 pesos, you know, is the equivalent of, uh, you know, $10 on the informal exchange market. And then you're seeing these stores of new private actors where there, there is more, there are goods available, right? It's, it's just a question that they're inaccessible. Um, so there's something very jarring about that. Um, best case scenarios, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I I continue to think that you can't, as much as the book I wrote, and I continue to think that as a, a, in general, that you can't reduce Cuba to the US-Cuba thing, as so often happens in our public discourse about Cuba, but you can't ignore it either. Um, and I continue to think that from that point of view, the United States needs to try to remove itself as the boogeyman inside of Cuba's internal politics. And for me, that means a more bold uh, policy shift that takes a long-term view 
Um, I continue to believe that. Um, and I've been frustrated by the lack of movement, the lack of vision on the part of the present administration, that I think is um, consumed by their concern about um, domestic political repercussions. Um, but inside Cuba, the best case scenario, uh, it, it's very difficult to, to envision at the, at the present juncture, the, the authorities um, you know, convening the kind of plural dialogue about Cuba's past that I think is necessary. Um, I think the best case scenario for me from the point of view of memory politics is not to see the imposition of a new of a new sort of uniform narrative, right? I think, I think there needs to be the space for people to work through their conflicted understandings of the past. Um, and also to make choices that might be uncomfortable to us as historians. You know, when I think about, um, you know, the at least two generations, maybe a bit more at this point who have come of age since the special period for whom these memory battles over the origins of the revolution, you know, it, it might seem utterly irrelevant to them. Um, and and it, we can make the case that it's deeply relevant, but I think you also come across this sort of almost like a nihilism among, among young people in particular that just want to sort of leave it all behind and move forward. And I, and, and that may be a choice that's uncomfortable to, as to, to historians who, who believe that, that history matters and should always matter, but, but that needs to be an option that's on the table, you know, in, 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 in some respects. Um, so I don't know. Um, I I, I want to. I also I think from a just a political economy point of view, I want to envision a scenario in which the economy is not just going to be sold off to the highest bidder or the person who's the most connected. I want to envision a scenario in which Cubans can build an economy from the ground up, not just from the outside in, in terms of foreign investment, on equal playing field um, with equal opportunities. Though we know that that's going to be very difficult to achieve. Um, and I want uh, a, a, to see a Cuba in which um, it's it's not presumed to be tantamount with treason to aspire to a more plural political system, period. Um, there are so many false choices that seem to trap us in the Cuban debate that to oppose U.S. policy means you necessarily support the status quo politically on the island. That's, that's not the case. That's not the case for most Cubans, I know. And there needs to be space to to recover the the memories and histories of Cubans who have long thought that. In fact, um, so that's a meandering answer to your question, but um, it's my best shot. Thank you. This has been a terrific, terrific time. Thank you for contributing to Conversatorio Cubano. Muchas gracias a ti, Lili. <laughs>